All right, here we are. This is Jay Brown Yoga Talks Podcast. My name is Jay Brown. Welcome to you. Your choosing to listen today is greatly appreciated. I am coming to you from one of my biannual visits to my in-laws in Virginia. Long-time listeners will remember I have come to spend time with my extended family here in Virginia pretty much every year except for 2020 when we were locked down. I have made this ritual visit to Virginia for, gosh, I can't even remember, more than a decade at this point. And it's always very useful for me personally to have even just this week where I remove myself from my usual routines and identifiers. It's always nice for me to be able to see myself in a different context than I'm normally operating in. And given that I only am here twice a year, it, it's impossible to avoid reflecting on where I was this time last year. And I wanted to mention that I wrote a blog, finally. <laughs> it, it hasn't been a good year for my writing, honestly. I think in 2020, I wrote nine blog posts in the whole year out of the usual 12 that I've wrote every year for 10 years prior. And this year, I only wrote four. And one I just published a few days ago. It's called The Reenchantment of Yoga. And I invite you to go read that. I would say that today's talk with Michael Mead in some ways is a it's like a companion offering, the blog and today's talk. Because I'm really in a different place this year than I was last. And it feels to me like an inflection point. I've talked about that on the show a number of different times about how I feel that there's been these inflection points in my life and those are the moments where yoga is most important or where all the practice I've done must come into play most. And it feels like we're in some collective moment of inflection here. And my guest today, Michael Mead, he has a way of expressing this and more in, in ways that I, I am personally inspired by and have been very helpful to me in recent weeks. It was kind of amazing, honestly, that I ended up having this opportunity to record with him. I, I was just listening to his podcast and reading his stuff, and I randomly went to his website and went to the contact page and, you know, wrote an invitation. It was one of those times, y'all, where I feel like the universe answered a call of mine. I, I called out and I asked for something, and it felt like I got it in the form of the today's conversation. And I, I really do mean that because it was so reaffirming of what I've been experiencing and thinking and feeling and of a direction that feels appropriate for me to go in and having people who can speak to it and help reinforce it in me is just invaluable right now. So I invite you to go read the blog. It's up on the website. And I'm so very, very grateful to Michael for being so generous to have this conversation with me. And I'm, I'm overjoyed to be sharing it with you today. Real quick before we get to that, 
I want to mention that my teacher training program that starts January 17th is starting to fill up some. So if you were considering joining me for that and you haven't gone to jbrownyoga.com slash training to fill out the three-question application or just email me and tell me you're interested, then you might want to get on it. There is still a little bit of time and there are some spaces left, but it is starting to fill up. And frankly, this training that I'm doing, it's a vehicle that I created to hold my own feet to the fire. This stuff that I'm talking about in terms of the direction I feel like I need to go and all the critiquing that I have done on this show over the years about the yoga world and yoga teacher training and what I feel is important. It's, it's what the blog post is about. If you read the blog, all this stuff that I'm sort of passionately expressing my views on, this training is where I need to like put up or shut up, you know? I got to bring it. I got to see if I can really walk my talk and I am utilizing it as a disciplinary tool for myself. And I am excited about it and nervous about it, but I'm looking forward to it. And I am inviting you to inquire. You can go to jbrownyoga.com slash training, fill out the application or send me an email, and I will send you some more information about it. Again, you might not want to sleep because it is starting to fill up. Also, let me give a shout out to our podcast premium subscribers because without them, this show would not be able to continue as it has. Today, I want to say thanks to Sarah Cox and Shahaf Eshel Zamir. We are so grateful to you as well as our other podcast premium subscribers. We are listener supported. And if you want to contribute to that, or you want to also gain access to the full archives of this show, which is quite a resource, becoming a podcast premium subscriber is the way to do that. It's choose your rate, cancel at any time. If you don't have any money, all you do is send us an email and we will definitely give you a free account. But if you have as little as $5 a month to contribute, you will be really helping, and we are grateful. To learn more about becoming a podcast premium subscriber and find out about all my other stuff, including the blog posts that I mentioned and the teacher training and my regular ongoing classes and meetings and all the stuff that I'm doing, everything can be found at jbrownyoga.com. Okay, y'all. I think that'll be it for now because I really just want to get to this talk today. (laughs) I will touch base with you on the other side. But for now, please enjoy this conversation that I had with Michael Mead. Hello, Michael. Hi, Jay. Can you hear me all right, Jay? I can hear you just fine. Can you hear me? Yeah, very clear. Wonderful. There's a a little magic to this moment for me. Mm. We don't know each other from anything necessarily, although who knows. (laughs) But, you know, I have been for a little while now really thinking a lot about the idea of resonance and wanting to better sing out the song into the world that I want to hear echoed back at me. Mm. I think, especially in the last two years, I got overwhelmed like a lot of people and got myself into a very reactive place with everything. And so I found my way to some other people, some writers. I had someone on the show named Joshua Shry. He was talking about animism. And I thought back to a book that someone gave me in college called The Reenchantment of the World by Morris Berman. I know Morris. You do? Well, I did, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Well, I don't know. Someone, a college professor, my freshman year of college, year was 1990, handed that book to me. And these things have been coming back to me. And I've really been 
singing out as best as I know how. And oh. I, one of the ways that I sung out was in the outro to this show, I said, if anybody listening to this knows anybody they think might be good for me to talk to, please reach out. Mm. And someone did. And his name was Andrew. So shout out to Andrew because okay. Andrew said, I think you would really enjoy um, taking some time to uh, look into the work of Michael Mead and the Living Myth podcast. And I did. All right. And so, you know, to go to your website and go to the contact page, you know, I, if you were a yoga teacher and you were familiar with this show, you know, I might have had some confidence that there was a possibility that I could get you to come on the show or something. But I don't know you or what your life is like or what your work is like. And I, so when I wrote the invitation on your contact page, yeah. in my mind, it was the equivalent of like a, like a spiritual Hail Mary pass or okay. something. Great. Great. <laughs> and this feels like the, it just got caught in the end zone, right. and I, the touchdown, because I'm actually speaking to you. That's great. So thank you so much no, for you're, you're welcome. deciding to do this and, and giving me your time. I really appreciate it. No. It's fine. I have an interest in yoga and, uh, and, and related things, you know, especially mythologies of India uh, and how they play into the philosophies that feed into yoga. So, uh, yeah. Well, that's interesting to me because one of the things, the reasons why I think that I've been coming to this and singing this song is that you know, I came to yoga in my early adulthood in the early 90s in New York City, and it was right at the cusp before it mainstreamed. And, you know, initially when I first got into it, it still had one foot more before the mainstream. And I was dealing with um, pain. My mom had died and advanced yoga was about inner peace. And, and it was mystical. There was a mystical air around it and there was the chanting in every class <laughs> and it had a ritualized aspect to it and these were the reasons i had read that book and this was like it felt like some means to have an experience of these kinds of embodied yeah. understandings yeah however as time went on and things got mainstreamed i started making a living at it i had a yoga center for 10 years wife and kids and at a certain point, certain aspects of yoga practice for me got downplayed because of like in the market, it was starting to be too weird or like people weren't as interested in the chanting because it was becoming more about fitness orientation. And I think that especially in the last year and a half, I have personally needed the, the chanting and the spirit. Yeah. And the intuitive knowing. <laughs> and some of these things, I've been kind of surprised that in my understanding, yoga practice really does live in a context of, of a world that you can talk to your ancestors in. And it's interesting to me that in certain ways that there's a yoga that's existing in a context out of that in like a more materialist context. And that's what I've been trying to sort out. No, that's great. Makes total sense. Well, I guess... To start with you, I'm just rambling on because I'm still in a little bit of shock that I'm speaking to you. But what I would say is I heard you speak about initiation. Yeah. And it seems to me that there is experiences that, that people would have that clue them into certain ways of seeing. And I, I heard you talk about an experience of being in a, in a prison in Panama <laughs> and I guess my question about that is, you know, in more indigenous cultures, like initiatory processes were ritualized and built into the cultures, but not in the culture that I grew up in, in Los Angeles in the eighties, they didn't have, we didn't have that. It ended up happening as a deathbed experience. And I guess I'm wondering about different sorts of initiations and how people come into seeing things in these ways. Well, for me, um, initiation is an archetypal dynamic. And I would say it is the underlying dynamic for transformation. So that when people are saying transformation, they're referring to initiation without knowing it. 
And so there are periods in history um, and there are times in different cultures when there were active rites of passage and practices of initiation. You can study them, um, but you can, in the modern world, rarely find them. So archetypes uh, kind of rise and fall like other things uh, across time. And so there were periods you can study it and see where uh, active cultural initiations were going on all over the world, and then it declined. And so, um, but when the archetype declines, uh, it doesn't disappear. It resides inside people. And so then what happens is the initiatory experiences are occurrences in life which trigger the archetype rather than practices that trigger the archetype. So for you, it's um, a deathbed experience. Uh, so let me just say the three elements, the three steps of initiation typically are separation, first step, often involving death, second step, ordeal, or struggle, or challenge, and then the third step, step a reunification at a different level. So death is an essential element of initiation. Now, initiation also relates to the what used to be called the core mystery of life, which is birth, death, rebirth, life, death, renewal. And so death is the middle of initiation, you could say, um, and it requires, so anything that feels like death in the psyche can trigger the sense of initiation and can activate the dynamic of initiation. So one way to consider archetypes is, is that they have, um, direction as well. They have vital energy and they have direction. And so when the archetype gets triggered, we're more aligned uh, with purpose in life and we have more vitality to fulfill it. Um, and you see this in, the, in, to me, the most immediate way to see it is the mother archetype. Uh, you watch uh, when a woman gets pregnant and you see, watch the changes and, the, and, and you watch the archetype come into play. And, and typically the new mother will have all kinds of uh, kind of awakenings and instincts about how to nourish the child and all kinds of things and tremendous vitality enough to create another life. Um, so initiation is another archetype. And so, um, so what I did, in, you know, we already talked briefly about my occasion that awakened it um, was when I was in prison. And, um, and then I was in solitary confinement and then I decided to fast and not eat anything for a long time. And, um, and what resulted was an experience of what I came to call the deep self or the deep soul. And I found that I wasn't alone and that inside wasn't just a vacant, you know, abyss that inside was something trying to awaken. And so I had that experience. And then when I come back to the regular world, I was a stranger in the world because I was an altered person. I was changed in a way that I had difficulty communicating. And in a way, when I did try to communicate it, other people didn't understand. And so I had to figure out what was going on. Was I just out of my mind or something else? And I remembered something about initiation and I went back and studied initiation and realized I was in a, an unplanned initiation. And so when you have initiation as a conscious practice in a culture, if you take ancient India or somewhere in adolescence, um, at least for the upper classes, uh, the young person would be taken to an ashram as an adolescent. And they would go through a rite of passage or an initiation in which, the, for instance, a common one, a red cord would be put over the right shoulder so it fell over the heart and came all the way down to the hip. And that would be done through a, a, a rite or, or a ritual. 
and they would, in a sense, be tied through the thread, which was called the Upavita, to the source of life. And so um, many, many, many young people would have from adolescence a full body, embodied, emotional, mental, spiritual experience of being tied to the source of life and introduced to a spiritual practice. And so then they would go back to the rest of their life. And often they wouldn't return to that until they were finished with the raising a family and having a profession or whatever. So, um, so you can track it wherever you want in the world. Um, and there's lots of information about it. But my sense is when there aren't formal rites of passage or formal initiations, we have informal initiations that attempt to happen because something tragic or profound happens in our lives. And so I feel like most of us are in unfinished initiations where the step of separation has occurred, the ordeal or struggle and encounters with death have occurred, but the reunification, the return, and the return uh, um, to community at a different level hasn't happened. But because it's archetypal, it has partially happened. Yeah, I love that there's an archetype <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that we could be, that could be playing out. I mean, because I guess the challenge and it's so interesting because I getting ready to talk to you, I did um, listen to another uh, podcast you did recently. And it, like those hosts of that podcast were talking to you for the same reason that I'm talking to you. And they were asking you about the same challenge I'm about to ask you. And you sort of described it, how you had this experience and then you go back to a world that doesn't even sort of acknowledge those experiences. So for people who are mid initiation uh, and looking for that last part, finding that in in a context in a world that looks upon that as like superstitious or religious has really uh, i think been the challenge for a lot of people and for me to even kind of be talking about these things on the show has felt like it's taken a bit of courage again because i don't want people to think of like it becomes a cult or like there's all this stuff happening these days to talk about it in a way that's more practical and rational that 99% of our ancestors thought of the world this way, maybe there's something to it. <laughs> well, and I think it's trying to return. I think that in the turning of the spheres and the seasons of culture and history and all that's happened, um, initi initiation, knowledge of it is, is required now. So one of the things I've been saying is we're now in a collective rite of passage. Uh, that is to say, the world as we knew it is gone. Um, we have separated from it. It has separated from us. I know some people are trying to go back there, but they're going to find out it doesn't work. Um, so the first step of initiation has occurred to us collectively. The world as we knew it is gone. And the world where we're in now has much, uh, much greater pronouncement of death. And I mean COVID pandemic but also I mean the loss of species in nature and all of the things that are happening. So we have climate crisis and COVID crisis, and, and that's enough to trigger the archetype of initiation so that for the most part, humanity is now in the middle step of initiation, having lost many things and departed from things that we knew. And we haven't yet arrived at another, uh, a, a new place of reunification um, which many of us are trying to imagine because once we accept that the world that we used to know is gone, then it means that the next world is possible. And we want that world not to be like the other world. And, and the classic way of understanding that now is rather than a world of division based on subject object uh, distinction, a world of interrelation where humanity reconnects with nature culture and nature rebalance and on and on and on. And everyone's welcome in the next world, for instance. So a, a reduction of racism and prejudice and things of that kind. Uh, but we're not there. We may be imagining and possibly envisioning it, but we're in the middle ground now, I think, which is the place of loss, 
darkness, confusion, great uncertainty, and ordeals of all kinds. And so to me, uh, first of all, the archetype of initiation is very uh, kind of uh, illuminating so that all meaningful experiences of life have some of that quality to them. We're not supposed to be at the end of our lives the same person we were at the beginning, an innocent, unawakened child. Um, so the whole thing is really initiatory. And, uh, but now it's pronounced and we're all in it at the same time. Um, so I think the, the sense, to, my sense is that the, in, the archetype is now activated in a greater way. Wow. So do you think that these archetypal cycles that you're pointing to, are these like an imperative of nature, a function of the universe? How do you regard these archetypes? Not just because they're not just that book that you have as a little boy that you talked about when you were 13. They're not like those fairy, they're not just fairy tales. They are kind of the, the stuff of fairy tales of like kids stories in a way, but isn't it more than that? When you talk about it, like we're going through this on the planet and now these yeah. cycles are kicking in. That yeah. sounds like Gaia. Yeah. It's, it's, see, it's, it's part of the mystery. It's not reducible to rationality. Uh, and that's important because part of the problem that we have, part of the reason we're in so much trouble altogether is because you humans decided they could dominate nature. And remember the enlightenment? Everything was be everything will become known, will shine the light everywhere. Well, interestingly enough, the enlightenment has led to the endarkenment. And we're now in the dark about what the future is, what the future of COVID is, what the future of climate crisis is, what the future of democracy is, what the future of human institutions are going to be. And so um, we're in this altered, altered state. And to me, uh, the core thing is imagination. How, how we understand, which if we're going to use a yogic view of understanding, it would be the asana in which you stand under. <laughs> understand means to stand deeper than the thing that, it, that is most common. Uh, and so that kind of understanding uh, requires imagination more than rationality. The, whoever was the poet that said, uh, imagination has a way of lighting on the truth that logic will never have. There are deeper truths than, than logic, logical equations, you could say. There are truths about the world, truths that connect us to nature. Interestingly enough, the word truth comes from the same root as the word tree. And so and when people are looking for truth, it's not abstract truth, really, that we want. It's organic the trees what <laughs> it's trees it's the trees well things like trees that have roots <laughs> that go down into the earth and and branches that reach for the heavens which is the one of the old images of humanity the strange being with with its feet on the goat's earth and its imagination in the, in the, in the starry heavens that's us and if you don't mind me saying the origin of yoga seems to be the initial attempts to yoke those two things together. I think that's a lot of what I've been coming to that, you know, Josh Wright calls them technologies of rapture, that these were like means for people to have the language of, of the universe yes. uh, communicate directly with it. Yes. Uh, and, and I think that that, and that is a universe in which, and I so appreciate you calling me out on my reductionist impulses because <laughs> that's right. Like to try to reduce archetypes down to some essence, what are they? How are they functioning? Like yeah. that question, that is kind of the impulse that um, gets in the way yeah. of, of some of what we're talking about maybe, right? Well, yeah. A, a thinking, a way of thinking or a, a viewpoint or something. If we go back to the mother archetype, it, it's a mystery. N not not a, uh, a practical plan. The mother formerly was a woman. One, one way to notice the presence of archetypal dynamics is language. So 
first as a woman and then she gets pregnant and now she's about to become a mother and her actually the way she's referred to the name is a different name it's a different being and so one of the I'm, i don't know why i'm going there so much but one of the sad things in the modern sense of of the world is that m- giving birth is not seen as initiatory um two things come out of the birth there's the birth of the child and there's the birth of the woman as the mother and 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 those are both initiatory that's birth was the first step of initiation in ancient india the way they imagined it that the first step of initiation was birth into the world and the last step was mm, rebirth into the other world or death and and then but then for the person who gives birth they have become a different person literally physically emotionally mentally spiritually and then so there used to be a uh, tremendous ceremonies of welcoming for the child um and blessing of the child but also welcoming of the mother and and blessings for the mother so that that tremendous experience w- which created life or brought mo- more life to life was initiatory for the child and for the mother and for the community and when you see the lack of that um the a kind of intelligence is lost emotional connection is lost and sense of the adventure of life is kind of lost as the process of pregnancy and giving birth becomes medicalized and becomes materialized not that people don't know better than that but the piece that's missing is where it becomes ritualized as initiatory I so appreciate what you're saying. I have two children and I witnessed those births and I talked about my mom's deathbed, but I witnessed both of those births. The first birth, all I remember is my wife's face because I was just looking at her and trying to help her the whole time. But the second child, uh, my wife didn't want me looking at her. She was kind of doing her own thing. And I was like looking at the other end of the table and witnessing what happened. Yeah. And I remember just, wow. Like she at one point turned to me and said, I don't think I can do it. And I said, you don't have to, it's happening. Like there was clearly forces at work yeah. that were beyond my wife. Yes. E- ethereal forces of, of yeah. life at work. And I witnessed it. And I said, that is, that is a magical phenomena that just took place that I witnessed. I know we're in a hospital and there's all these beeping things or whatever, and they're measuring things. But what I just witnessed with my own eyes and heart yeah. and soul was a phenomenon of magic the same as like when I look at the moon. Yeah. And that's what you're talking about. And that's what I, I started talking about at the beginning, that that kind of reverence and sacredness yes. uh, for everything yeah. seems to have been lost. And when did that happen? What happened part of <laughs> Well, we have too long a story to tell, but it's happened well, over time, right? And I think it happened partly the shifting of archetypes. That, that's part of it. That happens. Um, but also this uh, notion primarily in the Western world of the division of subject and object, a, a literal division, uh, which broke this, the interconnectedness of everything. And when the interconnectedness is gone, then uh, the objects all get uh, materialized in an exaggerated way. So, so the earth becomes an object in space. Uh, and, and even the child is objectified. Uh, everybody says, how, how long is the body and what's the weight and all those kind of things, which are interesting and even important for the medical side of things. But what spirit just came into the world? You know, in Irish mythology, they say that the, the child that's being born is only one third coming from the parents. I found that really helpful as a parent who was making a lot of mistakes, you know, because there's two thirds that I'm, I'm not even responsible for. Uh, your, your influence certainly seems to wane <laughs> very quickly. Well, yeah. And it also gave me a way to understand what, you know, cause I was one of those kids that when I got old enough, I said, how, how can this be my family? A mistake was made at birth. So, uh, but the way the Irish said it, the way the imagination of it goes is when the child is being born, uh, one third of it is what nowadays we would call the DNA, the, uh, you know, the contribution 
uh, from both parents on a, on a physical, a biological basis and psychological. And then another third is an ancestor coming back into the world, which means that the child is connected to something ancient and older than any of us, which is a, like a cool thing. Um, and then the third thing is a unique spirit is coming in with the child. So that used to all be understood to be happening. And the, the people that had the core understanding and were doing the, the real practice of it were the midwives. Um, and so typically women and midwife meant the one who marries the soul midway between the other world and the child coming into this world. And then the midwives were also the ones who did the preparation for people to leave this world after they died. And so they married the soul again at the end of life as it, <clears throat> excuse me, as it went back into the other world. And so then, so then you see the midwife as spanning the entire range of the mystery from birth all the way to death. And that's all gone. It's all gone. But it's because it's archetypal, it's not lost. It's just waiting to come back. See, I, I think that also you said that before makes a lot of sense that there were times when these things were more actualities happening and then the stories maybe were written down or I don't know when the stories are written, who knows? But then at some point they seem to play out in these subtle, more nuanced ways in terms of how people's lives are playing out, you know, these other kinds of initiations, whether it's being thrown in a prison or having a deathbed experience. Um, I guess my question about maybe specifically your initiation, that one moment, that one particular one that you mentioned, you know, you, you referenced like receiving messages and not being alone. And that's something that I've certainly experienced in my life, like signs, like getting signs that have helped me make, I think, a better decision in certain situations or even like receiving what felt like very direct messages. And sometimes I feel like it's something that's coming from within me. There's like a sat guru from within me that it's coming, but sometimes I've actually felt like it was potentially other entities. So I'm just, I'm curious if you can speak to that at all yeah. in terms of what are these? Cause I say it because it is a fine line to insanity. We're talking here, as you <laughs> said before, at least in some people's minds. Yeah. And so to try to kind of understand like, receiving messages or having these experiences in a way that n maybe normalizes them or doesn't make them supernatural? Because I don't think they're supernatural. I think they're natural. Well, yes. Yes to all the above. Uh, but the supernatural and the natural are connected. The, again, the subject-object exaggeration of rationality ha ha has diminished the world. You know, in, in West Africa, they still say, Nature is spirit with a green garment on. So, so what that gives direct information is when a person feels presence in nature beyond themselves, the amazing presence of an ancient forest or that kind of presence you can feel when you're going up the side of a mountain. That's not, you know, that's real. It's just real in the sense that it's a spiritual presence. Or something. And that shouldn't be shocking to anyone. It's only shocking if people has lost the connection to vertical imagination, uh, which everybody used to have. And so uh, what happened to me, just to say how I got into really studying it. So I had started out through a, a complex mistake, really, that I started uh, paying attention to stories, mythological stories, when I was 13. Um, and then I grew and, you know, carried that interest along, uh, but I went to school and all those kind of things where you couldn't talk about those things because they were strange or foolish. Uh, and then I found myself in this solitary confinement, not because I had committed some terrible crime, but because I refused to kill people I didn't know for reasons I couldn't understand. It was during the Vietnam War and I wouldn't do it. And then when I was in there, and this is where that third of the person that's ancestral comes in, I think, I just got the sense it's time to stop eating. And it was only later when I got out and I could study, uh, I found out it's an old Irish tradition uh, to fast against improper authority. And it awakened in me in that condition. 
In other words, the part of me that goes back to Irish ancestry was there and said, stop eating. That's what you do when you can't defeat an, 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 you know, an incorrect authority. So now I'm 20 years old. I've been for months in this solitary confinement and I've lost, I've lost a lot of weight. I was down to 87 pounds at one point. And, um, so naturally I'm having, uh, fantasies and all kinds of things. But, but the most dramatic thing that was happening really was characters from stories were visiting me, you know, like Odysseus from, you know, from Ulysses, from the Odyssey, uh, one of my favorites. And because he was so smart. And so I re really had to sit there by myself, which is how I was and say, okay, am I losing my mind or am I finding my mind? Now, I know now that one of the best ways to describe mind is the poetic unity of a person, not the brain or the intellectual thinking process, the poetic unity of a person. And so part of my mind that I got exposed to at 13 was the mythological realm, the realm of stories. And eventually I became a storyteller. I was on my way to that all along because that was part of my makeup. But what happened is characters from stories protected me. They guided me. They came and spoke to me. And yeah, someone could call it crazy, um, but it was life-saving and it was life-directing for me. And so when I got out of there, I was a different person. I had died. The me that was known before was gone and I came out as a different person, but no one could recognize that. Uh, and so I had to then work on my own initiation process, which included realizing how essential to me the realm of myth and story has to be. Um, and then, and you've alluded to this, I had to create the third step on my own. Everybody, I mean, I've done with audiences of all sizes. How many people in the audience have had the experience of separation? All the hands go up practically. And how many have the, had the experience of ordeals and death? And most people put their other hand up. And some people are standing up and waving because they've had so many experiences of separation and loss. Uh, and then I ask, and how many people have had the experience of coming back and being reunified and welcomed by a com community that understands what you've been through and can bless you for making it through alive and returning? And very few go, hands go up, and some of those are pretending that are up. <laughs> so the, the classic <laughs> thing is not to have the third step. And, and that's the majority of human beings. And so, um, so we're in this weird position, I think, where we're in the middle step collectively, and the majority of people do not have a conscious experience of arriving and being welcomed as a transformed person. And so we not only have to imagine the next world on the practical level, but I think we have to imagine how to create community so we can all find our way back to being genuinely part of interconnected humanity, which is then felt and understood to be connected, not just to... If you are hearing this message, then you're listening to the free version of J. Brown Yoga Talks. To hear the rest of our conversation, please subscribe to Podcast Premium at jbrownyoga.com slash premium.